Welcome everybody who may have just joined us to the Neighborhood Food Network call. This part of the call, we are going to focus completely on growing our own food, on the solution, on creating a parallel food system, right, outside of this toxic food system that we were just talking about earlier, and uh, which uses tons of agrochemicals and GMOs that are not being regulated. And we are going to talk about creating community and health and preparedness on our street. And um, I want to say that it's, you know, this is, it's exciting, but it's also daunting. Like if you can imagine the future with me just for a few moments where you and other neighbors, maybe a buddy that you have on this, on your street have connected with everybody on your street. You all have either each other's emails or texts, you know, some way to communicate with each other. You have uh, meetings could be once a month, could be, you know, a little bit less during, you know, during the winter, but more often during summer and spring. And um, you support each other in being able to have access to local food. And in case of a crisis, let's just say a pipeline hack, right? There's no gas. Uh, there, there's trouble with getting food to the grocery stores or food prices are spiking or there's a food shortage for other reasons like war or climate or whatever. Um, you are in touch with each other. You either have meetings or you're communicating and you're saying, hey guys, found out that there is a local cow. You know, here's a local, we could buy a local cow. We could go in on it together, right? If everybody chipped in X amount of dollars, we could get access to this local beef. Or, hey guys, I've got tons of zucchini and I wanna swap with somebody who has some whatever corn, right? And you're connecting with each other and you're sharing food and you're supporting each other rather than being a threat to each other um, because as I've mentioned before in other calls, the, the preppers and people who have a little bit more expertise in this area have said that it only takes nine missed meals for somebody to resort to violence to feed their family. So we want to avoid that scarcity situation and we want to support compassion and generosity and connecting with each other. So through the Neighborhood Food Network, if you go to neighborhoodfoodnetwork.com and we can put that link in the chat box for those of you who are just joining us. Um, we will support you in not only connecting with your neighbors and starting this program, but also with, um, let's see if I can get this up on the board here. Also, here we go with, um, with just growing your own food, the tips in growing your own food. So here we go. In this program, we invite you to initiate on your block, we'll create a parallel food system, one street at a time. We support neighbors to connect and empower each other to grow their food, support local farmers, get prepared in case of a time of crisis and be independent of the current toxic food system. And this is a pilot program. So we could be tweaking this and massaging this mission, especially if one of you wants to contribute some input and, um, and, and work with us on this. We intend to prepare for the worst and expect the best by fostering communities that are connected, compassionate, and thriving. So this is where you can find the Neighborhood Food Network and all the different resources that we have here. And this week, we want to talk more about garden pests. And um, Anne has been working hard on this, um, on this uh, section, and she is the inspiration for me growing food. We now have a quite a large garden and we've moved away from suburbia to a, a, we have a small farm in North Carolina and she is pretty much to blame for most of that. <laughs> so uh, she's inspired me by sending me texts of her tomatoes and her garden and all that kind of stuff all over, you know, almost every single day. And so she, I'm going to let her take it away with talking about some of the number one tips that you have for pests. And you want to start with. So one of the, um, I mean, pests are inevitable. Everybody's going to get them. And for um, me, a lot of these pests are not just the little insects that attack your plants. A lot of them, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard people talking about, you know, I, I, I planted this and the next day they were all gone by deer, raccoons, squirrels. I had a I had a groundhog that was munching on my stuff. He seems to have moved. I don't know if my cat had something to do with that. But the first year I put my garden in, I the first thing I planted was the summer I was just installing everything. And the only thing I had to plant at the end of the summer was um, garlic. And I was told um, by Will Allen that, you know, the, the squirrels might come and dig it up because they do that. So, 
floating row covers, if you go back up a little, floating row covers are, are a great way to put a barrier between the squirrels and your crop. And it worked great. In the spring, when the plants started growing up, I took the row cover off. And then you can move it and reuse the row cover somewhere else. Um, fencing is also a great way to keep pests out. Um, you've got deer fencing that you can put up. It's got to be about six feet high. But if you have a smaller area, I guess the deer aren't going to jump over a six foot fence if the, they see that the area is pretty enclosed. Um, I did use at one garden when I was living in an apartment building, I talked the uh, owners of the apartment complex to let me put in a vegetable garden and I put that plastic fencing around. Don't, don't waste your money. The, the next day I came out and there was little pieces of plastic everywhere. I, I'm sure the rabbits or whoever were just laughing as they were chewing through it. So, um, but there's just a lot. And, and then, the, then there's the, the companion planting part of it. That's really great. I, I have, I, I plant basil for every tomato plant that I have planted this year and last year, I have planted basil. I put tomato plants and basil on both sides. I have never had a hornworm. I don't know if that's why, but, but according to um, people a lot smarter than me, um, apparently a lot of these, a lot of these pests um, go by scent mm. and the basil confuses them and they can't find it. I'm sure Mark might, um, have more to say about that. But then I did find a great link here, the Farmer's Almanac. It has a really good companion planting guide. It's, it's, it's just a huge, 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 you know, subject about planting. You know, there's, there's, there's information on flowers that you can put in your garden. Um, and the funny thing was, is after I did this, I went here and for some reason, I, the images are having trouble showing up and it did it for me too. But the first thing that they mentioned was um, basil. Mm -hmm. So um, dill is also very good, I hear, for um, either repelling or there, like there's some plants that attract pests, so you can draw them away from, you know, from other. Yeah, they call them. I think Mark might even have talked about that about having a trap crop. Yeah, trap crops. Yeah. And then there's other plants that you plant, which repels them like marigolds and um, yeah, diff different ones. Uh, yeah, like nasturtium is one that will attract aphids and, and um, trap them and you know, keep them away. But marigold, uh, marigolds are the ones that, um, yeah, keep them away. Oh, Frankie's saying wood checks, woodchucks can decimate row covers in minutes, yeah. Yeah, so yes, yeah, certain certain methods will keep certain pests away and not others. Mark, did you want to talk a little bit about companion planting and trap crops? <laughs> no, uh, I wanted to mention first that not all pests are bad. Right. So has antennae, right, that it feels for. And it's looking for the sick individuals in a corn plant that should not be eaten by us. So mm -hmm. it takes many of the diseased or the weak individuals, which are going to have poor nutrient density and other things, right? And prevents us from eating them because the bugs take care of it. So typically, Bugs are attracted to the sicker plants, the unhealthier plants. So I just wanted to lead with that, that bugs are also an indicator species, right? Of what's going on. Maybe those plants are weakened because of compaction, or maybe you're missing nutrients in that corner of the garden, whatever. So not all of it is bad. Don't think that, you know, you, you need to kill every one of them because you need to read what they're telling you. So they're telling you something about your garden and your produce. That's especially true with flying insects that are extremely mobile and where they lay their future eggs, right? They're looking for the weaker individuals. The healthy plants can thort them off 
So they typically know not to lay their eggs there because they won't survive. So are you so are you saying that my squash bugs know which one of my squash plants is weaker? Well, I've seen I've seen every squash flower have an unbelievable amount uh, of beetles on it. So so it just depends. But just just okay. think about that when you're walking through your garden, and if you notice this plant's being attacked, but the healthy one next to it isn't at all. Make sure that's in the back of your mind because. They're telling you something, right, about your garden. Very, so, very good point. Get so I have, I have two cherry trees, and one had black aphids all over the, the newly formed leaves, and the cherry tree right next to it didn't. So this is a perfect example. Yeah. And Carol had a question? Yeah, I have a question, Mark. I don't know if, if, if you know, will know the answer to this, but you probably will. Um, in my greenhouse, we... Um, we have an infestation. It started with this one huge tomato plant of uh, white flies. And so we tried some different things. And the latest thing we're doing is um, we ordered um, through the mail, uh, one of the uh, natural predators to white flies, which is um, lace wigs was one of them, lace wings. And um, so we're, we're doing all their protocol and stuff, but it's been about two and a half weeks and it's looking pretty bad in there. And they've jumped over to a few more of the things in the greenhouse. Um, so I just wanted to know if you had any experience or Anne, maybe you might know something about this. Again, this is not outside, this is in our greenhouse experience but bugs um, and you can buy them by the gas and yeah we have those too. space and we're and release them that's that's great um you know so when you're in an artificial situation things are a little different uh than being outside so you got to factor that in um you know sometimes mother nature takes care of her own pests you know but then you get in a inside situation and all of a sudden you have molds, you have mildews, you have humidity changes that you don't have outside and it completely alters, right? What that plant is dealing with. So yeah, you can get certainly big ramp ups of, uh, of um, you know, uh, insects and things in a confined space like that. Um, but uh, we like beneficial uh, insects too. You know, you can buy them or you know, you can grow grow plants around your garden that naturally attract them to. That's that's helpful. Uh, catch crops, you know, or uh, things that are inviting. So all that's a win-win. The biggest thing I would say is diversity is the solution. So plant, you know, rather than planting 10 species, think about planting 120 native species or species that are well adapted to your particular reason, mm -hmm. uh, your region. Um, and I think that's the best approach. We put 40 foot prairie buffers all the way around our fields and we're starting to, tr to figure out the science of how many feet within the field should we have a prairie planting to have habitat for you know all of the beetles and other things that help eat weed seeds and eat other insects and eat fireworms and eat slugs. And so, yeah, all that's really, really important. Um, but uh, the biggest thing is, I think, is learn what that insect is telling you. That's a great point, Mark. Thank you so much. I'm going to share screen. One of our first sponsors for Moms Across America being in parades was Rincon Ventova. And these are uh, these were a wonderful couple out of I believe out of California. Uh, wait, not sure about that. Maybe I met them in California, and um, and they sell bugs that you can buy to help get rid of um, you know different other bugs on your farm. So for instance, uh, one the the first year we started growing food in our garden, my uh, husband wanted to protect his family from the wasps that were growing, you know, making their little homes on our porches and he got a spray and killed them. And um, our, one of our friends that has bees was very upset about this. And we learned from her that wasps actually go after harlequin bugs. 
So guess what attacked our garden <laughs> last year? Thousands of Harlequin bugs. And so we would go out there and have to kill them by hand because um, it didn't seem like it didn't seem to us like the diatomaceous earth didn't work didn't worked uh, super well on them. So that's I just want to add in and chime in here on some pest um, overall pest um, management. We learned I didn't try the grow cover, but a soap a cup of water, you know, halfway uh, filled up with soap in it. You just go out there, you pick the bug off, and you put it in the cup and it will die in the soapy water. And um, so you just get your kids or somebody to go out there and just pick the bugs off and put them in there. And you do that every morning or every evening and you will be one of your one of the pests uh, worst enemies um, in doing that. Another one is, uh, as I mentioned before, diatomaceous earth works with certain beetles. Um, but keep in mind when you do use that, you may be killing off some beneficial bugs as well. So you want to really only use that in a certain situation where it's, where it's highly needed. And um, orange peels, as I mentioned on the last call, if you eat an orange, just chop it up into little bits and squeeze it a little bit. And then just when you walk out in the morning to your garden, check it and just throw it around your spinach, your cabbage, your broccoli, and it'll keep away certain bugs. I'm not sure which ones. And Sylvan, you have a question. No, it's another question. It's uh, it's an experience about about bugs. Great. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just to so I'm, I'm I made an experience with uh, seed balls uh, on, on a farm, and um, I, I had access to the piece of land, but very late, and I I planted a lot of uh, mustard, um, uh, kale, uh, bok choy, pak choy. All these. Uh, not only you have to protect those. Uh, uh, those plant because they will be uh, badly eaten. But I planted um, very late um, in the beginning of August and had had no absolutely no problem with 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 pests with bugs, and uh, and also there was a lot of weeds. Some some of the weeds I I, I, I killed but with um, um, just killed. But some some I just cut cut the weeds and uh, like. Uh, Pigweed. There were there was a lot of uh, insects uh, uh, on on the, the pigweeds, and I was I was careful not to 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 just cut them enough to to so my my my, my crops would grow, but uh, just uh, I left some uh, something to eat for the for the for the, the bugs, but because the I, I think that probably bugs would will will sometimes so you have timing you can time your crops with some crops when. You plant them in some season. That's the that's the cycle. The bug cycle is just so you get attacked. And if you plant outside the bug cycle, so you have to learn. You have to learn what the insects like, have. In did, yeah. Did you mention was it squash earlier that you mentioned? If you plant it later, then you're less likely to get the squash bugs or the melons, watermelons. The, 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 and stuff like that. No, what, maybe I don't know. But it was uh, it was uh, uh, brassica? I mean, uh, kale, mustard, yes. uh, pak choy. Uh, yeah. No, and uh, yeah, I think I think it's, yeah, that's that's the idea, and I, I like the idea of having uh, some uh, some weeds that I can, I can eat, but also that the bugs like, and they, they will go on the weeds instead of my plants. I it's did not know that about pigweed. We just pulled a bunch out of our our, our three sisters' patch. So you're saying there's certain bugs that will go to the pigweed instead of to your crop. So it may not yeah, be such a bad. Yeah, the, uh, it fits. It fits in this case, and uh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, pigweed. Uh, I've eaten them since I'm very young. We we we, we were. Uh, my my mother, we were picking so much pigweed that we had. My mother had to let some plants, normally the the red stem one, to to make seeds. Otherwise, we wouldn't have uh, any pigweeds because we really ate a lot. And but uh, if you read uh, the uh, uh, there's a book, there's a classical book. As I don't, I don't remember the name, but the, the what the guy the guy observed the how the Amerindians were 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 gardening. And they let a lot of weeds in their in their crops, and the the and the idea is you have some pig weeds, some uh, some amarant, something, but you control the quantity of these uh, the weeds. These 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 plants are very uh, robust uh, root systems that can go very very far, very very deep, and uh, your corn or your will your corn will follow these uh, the 
this uh, channel made by the, the the roots of the weeds, and 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 instead of rubbing water to the the, the, the crop, your crop will be will have more water because you let you have let some some weed not not too many but just enough. So that's yeah timing and yeah that's what. Uh, well, no. <laughs> very interesting. I learned something new today. I did not know that pigweed was edible. Oh, it's very good. Fantastic. Yeah. What I just found a recipe here for pigweed and purslane pizza. <laughs> oh, great. Yes, Mark. And then Kate. I just I, I just like to follow up. Why is it called pigweed? Oh, because pigs like to eat it? No. Where is pigweed found? In pig pastures. Uh -huh. What are pig pastures? <laughs> high in phosphorus and potassium. So you'll typically only find pigweed where your phosphorus and potassium levels are very, very high. Oh. So it's a symptom of your soil. And that's why we say healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy people. So you can tie this, a lot of your insect problems and your weed pressures all go back to what's happening below your feet. Interesting. Okay. And there's certain um, manures like uh, rabbit manure is high in magnesium and potassium, I hear. Um, I'm not sure if goat is too, but there's certain areas of my pasture where my goats poop. And I think that's where there's higher uh, amounts of pigweed. So um, I'm going to try to pull a picture up of pigweed while Caitlin, uh, Caitlin, you want to ask a question or comment? Go ahead. Um, I had a couple questions. Super new to this back home gardening thing we just started this year and so we're doing raised beds because i don't have the space to do it in the ground and cultivate all this stuff so we had to buy buy our soil um but i think you guys talked about it last week but i missed it for we're having squash bugs and vine squash vine borers mm -hmm. first i was like trying to leave everything so i'm like biodiversity let's keep all the stuff i didn't really realize that they were killing my plants until it was too late are we just picking these off as much as possible are you guys diatomaceous earthing um the soapy water trick i just i'm kind of like at a loss i don't know what's good and what's bad and how much to like disrupt the biome but like they eat or i eat i don't know <laughs> that's a good question is ann or mark do you have any or or practice sylvan do you have any i, have, I haven't dug into that so i'll defer to, to mark or one word of caution towards diatomaceous earth it's really really good um, look up a um, zoomed in p uh, picture of diatomaceous earth. Um, the reason why it works is as the insects crawl through it, it cuts their exoskeleton and they dehydrate um, and die. Um, it also does the same thing to humans if you ingest it into your lungs. So please, 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 when you're using diatomaceous earth, wear a dusk mask. You can get very ill from inhaling diatomaceous earth. Now, ingesting diatomaceous earth is actually no problem. It's actually very good for you. But just be careful of the airborne side of diatomaceous earth because it isn't good for your lungs. And Carol says even food grade is doesn't matter, it, it scratches, right? It's doing the same thing in your lungs. It's scratching any, every one of your cell membranes as your, as your lungs are inhaling and exhaling. So that's the problem. It's a physical, uh, physical thing. Um, I not, oh, sorry. I, I'm not sure I can answer the rest of your questions. Um, I, I wouldn't use a full spectrum, um, you know, pesticide, um, I would kind of let the insect populations build up. And uh, if anything, I would plant some more. I, I would help your plants out by fuller feeding some compost teas and other things and trying to restore the balance. A lot of things can be fuller fed through the leaves, which will help heal the plant. And also, believe it or not, there's studies showing now that it helps heal the soil. So I would look um, at some of that uh, as helping your plants. And, and if your plants are healthy, 
they will know what to do with the insects. Okay, so you said fuller feed? Yes, so, so okay. get an organic fuller feed. There, there's lots of things that you can, you can buy, but it, it's basically made from high quality compost. You're taking the microbes and the fungi out of the compost, putting it into water, and then you're spraying that mixture onto your plants. And, and they absorb it through the stomatal and some through the root system as well. And it's just beneficial and it gives your plants a burst. You know, like uh, coffee is not a good example, but you know how coffee is a pick me up? The same thing with compost tea and plants, right? You give them a bunch of nutrients, you give them the balance that they're looking for, and they perk up. And then all of a sudden they're stronger to help ward off the insect or whatever's chewing on them. So, also plants, you know, you, know, you talk about chemicals, plants have thousands of things at their disposal. So when they get chewed on a couple times, they will react and change their chemistry to counteract that insect. There's also things they can call and bring in, but you have to realize that takes time. So it's not immediate, right? By the time they, call, by the time they extrude something that brings the beneficial predator in, it might be two weeks, right? It doesn't happen in two hours. So Mark, so, um, I was watching something on YouTube about aspirin and using that, diluting that, got aspirin in a gallon of water and spraying it on the plant as a fuller feed that helps pump up the plant's defenses. And I didn't know if you knew anything about that. Well, I know aspirin is originally uh, derived from trees but I don't know specifically what, what is in it. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would buy some high grade certified compost, um, put a strainer in a pail, uh, some cheesecloth, put it, put, submerge it in a five gallon pail, let it in there for 15, 20 minutes, pull it back out and take that solution and spray it on your plants. The reason why I say certified compost if you use uncertified compost, you can have um, the, the bad bugs in there. And if the bad bugs get in your water solution, you can set your plants back. So if, if the compost is made properly and is certified, you're gonna get the right beneficial bugs. If you have compost that went, went aerobic or, or never got up to temperature and has bad guys, pathogens in them. We didn't get to hear what that's you been said. Properly done or make it yourself, right? Um, but just do it properly. And, and when, it, when it's got to be turned, it's got to be turned, right? You can't say, oh, I'll do it next week. So, um, but that's what I would use, uh, you know, is a compost tea. You know, I think we probably will have a whole um, session just on compost teas, like how to make them or, you know, different um, amendments, right? Different fertilizers and things like that, that you can use. Um, that is a, a great point. I don't know if I have the book right in front of me right now, but there's a, there's a great book by Nigel Parker and it's called, it's, it's about um, organic or regenerative organic, organic, regenerative organic amendments for soil. Um, and it's by Chelsea Green. And he talks about wonderful amendments that you can make without even any animal manure. Like you, you can, like for instance, if your peppers are starting to get yellow, that's a sign, Howard Ligger told me this, that you need more nitrogen in your peppers. And this usually happens when there, um, you, use, you have uh, wood in your mulch because the wood mulch seeps out the nitrogen when it's breaking down. So you have to add more nitrogen. So he said, I could just take a cup of my chicken poop, put it in a five gallon bucket, let it sit for three days, and then use one cup of that solution and put it in another, like a watering can, you know, like a, a gallon or two of watering can, and just pour that all over my peppers right on top on the leaves. That's what it's like a full, or I could have sprayed it, right? A full layer spray, but get it on top of the leaves. And within a day, they were all green again. So you can take animal nutrients, but you can also just take the weeds from your lawn or weeds that you've pulled out of the garden 
and throw them in a bucket with water, let it sit for three weeks to six weeks. I don't know, it just sort of depends. That, that book says a lot about that. And you can add those nutrients back to your soil. Like you could take a tomato plant that's been pulled up and let it sit all winter in a bucket of water. And then next spring, use that tomato water as a, as a fertilizer for your tomato plants. It's the perfect fertilizer, right? And then when you have the, the soil balanced with the right nutrients, the weeds don't grow because the soil is balanced and healthy. That's so, what you're so about, right, Mark? That I, I'd like, like to just say one thing about that because that's so critical. Realize that the microbes below ground eat before your plant ever eats. So if you make the microbial population below ground happy and healthy and full, they will exude the nutrients from the soil, making them available to the plant. That's why your pepper plants, I think you said, um, you were using a high C, C to N ratio um, wood and the microbes had to decay the wood. It takes nitrogen to, to decay the wood. So they robbed all the available nitrogen from the soil to decay that wood. And so your pepper plant suffered. You're absolutely right. So the microbes eat before we eat. If we take care of the microbes, you don't have to worry about your crop. You'll have a great crop, but we haven't quite learned how to take care and feed the microbes. So your microbes blow soil, never have a bad day. And that's our goal as a regenerative farmer. Never let your microbes um, have a bad day or your fungus, right? So. That sounds like Absolutely. a lot of work. Thank you, Mark, for being up to that. Did you age get your question answered, Caitlin? Yeah, I uh, I just had one more. If you guys have any tips on tomato russet mites, I all of a sudden I have pests in my garden, and we started so strong and so good, and then like I just had to pull my squash. All my tomatoes are starting to turn, and I know one goes and the rest, but it's like most of Google says there's nothing you can do. So apparently my soil is not doing great even though i bought really expensive organic soil that i had trucked in because i don't have any here and it's only my first growing season so i just don't know <laughs> i think one of the things that you need to do is you can get a, a contact your local extension office and, and get a soil testing kit and send some soil in there and they give you instructions on how to do that because even okay. though you've got this organic soil it might be lacking in something okay something. Have you Thank had you. have you had extended dry weather? Yeah, it's been triple digits for ten days in a row here. So, so, so mites don't tolerate rain. So if you can um, upset them, they actually will get killed in a rainstorm, right? Huh. So once you go through a drought, usually you have problems with mites. Their population explodes. So I don't know if you can literally wash your plants right with a hose. Um, yeah. You know, and do that like three days, two or three days in a row. Please do it so that the plants dry off and you don't. Uh, you said, please. Uh, you, so you told her to spray the plants, like wash them to get the mites off for three days in a row. And what'd you say after in that? The in the morning. In, in the, the morning. morning. Okay, so it can dry off. Okay, because otherwise yeah. you, get, you get like a fungus, yeah. right? On tomatoes. Fungal, fungal problems. Yep. The other thing is take a proactive approach. Um, there's a company called Jab of the Carolinas, G-A-B-B. -B. They make a product, an organic certified product called Bavaria Bassiana. It is a beneficial, I can't remember if it's a microbe or a fungi, but it grows systemically with the plant. It's quite amazing. Uh, go on their website and look at all the different things it controls. And all that is is a seed treatment. So you either take a dry powder or liquid, slash it around with your seeds and plant the seeds. And it acts as a protective agent all year long because it grows systemically with um, your plants. We do that on every dry bean that you get from Doodle Farms Organics. Awesome. It's Bavaria Bassiana as a seed treatment. That is fantastic. Thank you. All right, great. All right, I'm putting the link on the page that has that um, Bavaria Bassiana. So there you have it. And I'll put it in the newsletter that I send out um, tomorrow or the next day. Great. Mark, Thank you. 
it's always a good day when you're in our lives because we're always learning something new. That's mm -hmm. right. And we like to learn something new. So, so I want to, can I go back to the white fly issue that we were talking about earlier? Because Michelle, who's on the call with me, will testify. We were um, starting our plants in a, in a local greenhouse and there were some white flies flying around. We didn't know what they were. We were told not to worry about them. And then we brought the plants home and it got so bad in my garden, it almost looked like it was snowing. I had ladybugs everywhere. They couldn't keep up. And so I got, um, I was, I was trying to spray them off. I was trying to do everything I possibly could. I wanted to have a vacuum, uh, vacuum out there, seriously. And so what I ended up doing was in the fall, I did not, I did not compost any of my plants. I had garbage bag after garbage bag going out of the garden. And then I covered all my beds with black plastic. And the next spring when it heated up, supposedly killed any overwintering eggs, but um yeah they're, they're everywhere white they're flies are no joke you know they literally were destroying some of my plants yeah. so, well anyway. thank you for thank you for sharing that um i want to jump to okay i want to finish up with the pest things and i have um one other issue that i was supposed to mention in, in the previous call but i did not so um one other thing about pests, just want to talk about what I'm dealing with right now. I saw a deer in my field, the three sisters pooped in the, so I have this big field right now that is not protected except for a, a border of four foot fence. So the deer can hop right over that. They laugh at that. Yeah, I had put some Irish spring sort of bells, like basically plastic bowls with a bar of Irish spring underneath it, like a bell, you know, so when it rains, it doesn't get on the soap deer hate the smell of Irish spring, but apparently it wasn't keeping this deer away, right? Maybe not close enough, not enough of them. So um, I got the idea, our neighbor wants to get rid of bamboo and my kids love to use a machete on things. So they just went and hacked about a hundred, like 10 foot tall sticks of bamboo. So they're gonna build, add on to the current fence that we have with a whole bunch of bamboo on that part of the fence line because the other part of the property is that there's a big hill that it's not as likely the deer will be able to jump over that. So we're just gonna start with very big bamboo. So it's a free source, you know, and getting to know my neighbors really helped. And so that's just one idea. They, yeah, they don't like the smell of Irish spring and also mothballs. Mothballs are pretty toxic, so you don't wanna to touch them. But what I did was I made, um, and some people disagree with me on this, but, um, I only have Fiji water if we have water bottled water, right? So I have Fiji water bottles, plastic ones, and um, we'll put mothballs in the bottom and then you cut a V-shaped like little vent and you pull up the plastic so that the air can come through and animals will smell the mothballs. Now, fox and raccoon and other animals that you are you know pretty difficult to keep out from going underneath fences they don't like the smell of mothballs. So um, I, you know, I'm not putting it in the soil. I'm just, it's just something that the animals will smell. So that's another idea. Also neem oil is very good as a general overall pest repellent. You just put a little bit of neem oil in water. I don't know how much, would you like a teaspoon or two? Do you know, Anne, how much neem oil to put in a spray bottle? Um, it's a, yeah, I think it's like a tablespoon to per gallon. Tablespoon poop tablespoon per gallon. I, I'll, I'll look that up because that was one of the things I was going to be putting up on the website. So I'm going to, I'll be doing a little bit more um, right. okay. information on, on research on that. Okay. And um, so neem oil is very efficient for a lot of different pests. And also a new one that we've learned is that grubs, like slugs and grubs really don't like it if you put a, a couple few slices of, of cucumber in a pie tin with a little bit of water. It's supposed to keep a lot of pests away. So if you have aluminum pie tin, you put it out, a little bit of water and the cucumber slices, the interaction of the aluminum and the cucumber for some reason drives pests nuts. So there's a tip for you there. Um, Sylvan saying, did you know Sepp Bolzer, a permaculture farmer? Um, he has a recipe of bone tar or bone sauce he makes to repel deer. I did not know that. Yeah. I would oh. have to look that up. Okay. Yeah, Seth, you, you'll learn a lot with uh, this guy, Sepp Holzer, which is a permaculture farm in uh, Austria. Austria. You have, you have a, a lot of a lot of wonderful ideas. 
Oh, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I like uh, when in the idea that I, that, that, that I love, it's not, it's not ordinary gardening, but it's using um, fruits, uh, seeds, cherry, apple, uh, and growing trees from seeds. And uh, you, get, you get very uh, uh, vigorous plants. And of course, the fruits are not always as, as big, but they are a lot more um, perf perfume in them. And he, sell, he sells them to make alcohol, high quality alcohol. Wow. But all kinds of ideas like that. that uh, Great. One thing I learned recently too is don't get freaked out if you have some pests eating your spinach or your lettuce, because actually the studies have shown that the plants that had a few bug bites in them had higher antioxidants. So it's like they get stronger because something is eating it and it's like a defense mechanism and it, it, it gets stronger. It has more um, nutrients in it. So, you know, we can share, right? We can share. <laughs> so it's okay to have some, you know, some bites out of some of it. You just don't want your, your, your whole plant, you know, decimated for sure. Yeah. And, and, and a few bugs eating your plants will, uh, will, will have, you'll have a, you'll have a bigger yield because not only the antioxidant, but the, the, there's a reaction but at some le level, you will, a, little, a little bit of, of, of uh, pest will help your plants grow. It's, it's uh, a little bit Isn't that amazing. Yeah, I learned that voles and I don't know if it was voles or moles, but I was trying to get rid of them. And one of the um, I think it was somebody on one of these calls reminded me that they actually aerate the soil. So they help and they also transfer um, help transfer micro, you know, bacteria and microbiome from back, microbiota from one area to another. And so it helps make the diversity of your soil, you know, improved. And if you really want to keep them out of a certain area, plant a bunch of oregano along the edges of that area. Moles and voles don't like oregano. So um, you could try that. Um, Jody's asking which insect pests would be okay and healthy to eat. I don't know. I'd like to know this in case of future food shortages. <laughs> I don't, I mean, people eat crickets, right? Apparently in some places, silkworms in Korea, crunchy fried silkworms are considered a delicacy. Um, I don't know about the bugs to eat. But. I'm not ready for that. Yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Grasshoppers, ew, yes. Yeah, not ready for that. Um, yeah, we, we will enjoy the produce in the farm right now. Okay, so um, I did say that I would share about something um, about my uh, goats and goat milk and all this stuff. But did, did anybody else have any input first about pests? Any other questions or? I have a question. Yes. Um, it's about garlic. Mm -hmm. so uh, over the last years, I ordered garlic specifically to grow garlic from this great place in um, Asheville. They're like a garlic farm and they were expensive. So I decided this year to get organic garlic from the store and I planted it and it didn't work. It didn't come up, it, you know, it came up as weeds. So I'm wondering when you plant garlic, do you have to get a special garlic? I mean, this was organic, so I didn't think it was sprayed. I, um, it, it, you know, depending on your region, like where I live up here, it mines heart. I plant hardneck because it's it'll do well up here. And then um, down there, I think you guys can get the soft neck, you know, the kind you can braid. So no, I live in Massachusetts, and when I called Ash in Asheville, they said to do hard neck. So I did. Oh, I don't but know. I don't know. When I bought the garlic, I didn't know if it was soft neck or hard neck. When I bought it at the store, it didn't say what it was. Yeah, I did that too, Joanne. Um, uh, Joan, I bought one year. I bought expensive garlic, and then the next year, this past year, I just bought a bunch of garlic from the store. But what I did was I bought different kinds of garlic from different places, just in case something didn't come up. And I planted like 200 bulbs or cloves and, um, and almost all of them came up. So I would just suggest that you, you like biodiversity, right? You don't buy just one type you from one place, you buy a bunch from different places if you want a big crop of something. Um, and keep an eye on it because you never know it might come up later or 
I, you know what I mean? It, you never know. It could come up later. So let's see. Um, Sylvan saying good companionship. You saw on an organic farm is planting a row of radishes side by side with broccoli and the radishes are sacrificial crop that the insect will prefer to eat instead of the broccoli. And you may get a, a lot of radishes. Yes. I was just told to plant radishes around my squash, which I just did. And radishes grow up very quickly, like 30 days or something like that. So um, I guess maybe they will be more of a sacrificial crop. My radishes did terrible. I just pulled them all out. They didn't do it. They were in there for two months and I didn't get anything. So really? I don't know. I have a feeling I might, I might have a soil issue I'll have to check on. Oh, speaking of soil issues, and you sent me a link to that homesteader girl, woman, sorry, I shouldn't say girl, woman. And she was saying that there was a thing going on with contaminated soil. So I don't know, is Caitlin still on? She may have left, um, but there was a thing going on with contaminated soil. So if if you are having issues, and I liked your suggestion a lot of testing the soil, um, because you may need to remediate the soil or something, right? I don't I don't know what you would do in that case with contaminated. You'd talk and to the tests about. aren't that expensive. I think I looked. I think it was twenty four dollars, and they send you the kit. But you'll just check with your local extension office. Just look up soil testing in your area, and they'll tell you exactly what to do. I haven't done that yet, but they say to take it from several different areas of your garden. If your garden's not that big, it, maybe you wouldn't have to yeah. do it. But if the soil is different, then I would do different tests. But if the soil is pretty much the same in the whole garden, then take samples from different areas of your garden and put it together. If you, if you have a problem with a certain area of your garden, take that soil test separately. Yeah. and try to figure out just that area. Good point. Yes, good point. If you've got a pest overriding a certain crop in that area, then definitely um, test that soil. And also I would move your, you move your crops around every year, plant your, plant things in different areas, you know, different year. And there's, there's advice on that too in planting. One year you plant the tomato, don't plant the tomatoes this, there the same year, move them to a different place. Um, we'll go more into detail on that on the website as well. All right, so I said I would cover this issue in the previous call, but I, I didn't get to it. So I just wanted to address that there's a lot going on around about these cattle dying, the 10,000 cattle. And um, I don't know what is really going on. I wanna be clear about that. But I have some questions that I think have not been answered by the USDA. So you know how when there's contaminated romaine lettuce or contaminated I don't know, chicken or something, they tell the public where the source of that came from, right? Oh, don't buy the romaine lettuce at Kroger's or it's, you know, Safeway or whatever, or at this particular store or that particular place. They did not do that with the Abbott formula that was positive for Cronobacter and Salmonella, right? They didn't tell the public where that milk came from. Because it came, it was it, it's baby former, right? It's the, the most likely suspect for where that bacteria came from was the milk. And um, milk, milk, as we know, comes from cows that are probably 90 to 95% fed in the US GMO grains with glyphosate sprayed on it and a host of other chemicals which have been shown to cause antibiotic resistance, meaning superbugs, bacteria that cannot be killed with antibiotics. And these this antibi this bacteria in the Abbott baby formula is so strong that it, it lives in dry formula. This bacteria lives in dry formula. So it's highly processed dry formula that's still alive and has a very high death rate. There were like 128 serious illnesses of baby babies. We don't know if they're permanently damaged or not, but serious illnesses reported and nine deaths. And, um, Yes, and, and it was even higher death rate for some that were directly connected to Abbott. Like there were like five babies that got sick and three of them died or something, two or three of them died. So very high death rate. And they never told us where this, this milk came from. So I have a theory that there is an increase of antibiotic resistant bacteria that's getting into our food supply. And um, the government is telling those food producers that they can't sell those products. So what is going to happen when a food producer has milk or meat or a food product that they can't sell? They will destroy it by an act of God, 
like fire, right? Or heat so that they can collect insurance. So this is just my theory. I have no proof to show this, but I would just ask people to think beyond like, oh, the government's trying to kill us all by like creating a food shortage and, you know, you know, cutting us off from food supplies and all that kind of stuff, right? Like I would just ask to consider beyond that because I have questions about whether where that bacteria came from, what milk did it come from, what feed lot, most of them are most likely a confined animal, you know, feeding operation. Um, where did that milk powder go to in other products? Is it in cake mixes? Is it in other processed foods? Is it, in, you know what I mean? Is it in smoothies and McDonald's, right? Like, I mean, you know, milkshakes, where, where did that product go? So there's a lot of questions that are not being answered. And, um, and I think that that needs to be followed through. So I did a Freedom of Information Act. We'll see what, we'll see what they say about that. It might take a couple months, but they have to legally respond. The FDA has to respond in, you know, where, where are the sources for where those, um, where did that bacteria and stuff come from? So Anne is saying, um, let's see, uh, Frankie's oh. asking, what's up? When you say what Frank, Frankie was asking about what these soil tests are looking for, and I just told her they're looking for mineral deficiencies and stuff like that, and then they'll tell you how to amend your soil and what you should. Okay. Eat. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you for all the great information tonight. And before we go, I just want to share my latest adventure is um, milking goats. <laughs> and so we got two milking goats. There was a gentleman that is having a change of a life situation and wanted to, you know, rehome his goats. So he gave us two milking goats and, um, and with their babies. And um, so we get, I got almost a quart on my first day and um, you just, what you do, it's really pretty darn easy. There's, there's three ways to make goat cheese. The first way is you can just buy the culture, right? And mix it in. You heat the milk up to 86 degrees, or if you get it right out of the goat that's been milked, you strain it to get any hair or dirt out. There's a, you just use like a nut bag strainer. Um, you strain it and that milk should just be around 86 degrees coming out of the mommy. And you can put a culture in and stir it. And when it's, you know, once it's 86 degrees and then set it aside. And with the culture, you need to let it sit for 12, 12 to, something hours, 20 hours until it becomes a curd, like curd like this. You see this like a very thick yogurt. And then you put it into a, um, a cheese cloth. Maybe do I have a picture of that? All right, well, first you mix in the salt. See, there's the curds and putting it into the cheese cloth here. You're, what you're supposed to do first is put it in, a, in the cheese cloth and mix in your cheese salt 1% by weight. I just sort of guess, but real people, real cooks will actually weigh it and measure that. 1% by weight cheese salt, you mix that in and then you have it in this cheesecloth and you just let it drip into a bowl. You hang it up. I hang it on my kitchen cabinet over the washing machine here. And be careful, this is very acidic. It will you know, damage wood or other things if you get it on a countertop. Um, and so you just let it drip. And if you've used a culture, you're supposed to let it, I think you let it drip for like six hours or something like that. And then it becomes Go cheese. So it's really, you know, that, that process will take about a day. So is that amount that's in that bag from the quart of? Yes, you have a quart. Yeah. It's a little bit, it's less than a cup. It's a small amount. So most people do a gallon at a time, but I don't get a gallon out of my goats at a time. If I had a couple of goats, I would get a gallon. So, um, so the other way to make, there's two more ways to make goat cheese, which are pretty awesome. Wait, okay. Stop sharing. Um, so the other way to make goat cheese is simply with, I think it's a, for a quart, I think it's either a third or a quarter cup of lemon juice and a tablespoon of vinegar. So that causes it to separate. And you only need one hour, one hour of, to let it sit. Then you do the same thing. You put it into the um, cheesecloth, you mix in a little bit of salt, and then you let it hang for one hour. So I made goat cheese, like by lunchtime, we were having goat cheese. Um, yesterday we had some friends and they helped make the milk and I mean uh, milk the goats and we made goat cheese and then the third way is with stinging nettle I didn't know this I found this from master class stinging nettle I guess it has some type of acidity in it you so it's a nettle it's a it's a herb it's maybe people call it a weed it's very very useful 
and you just make a tea out of stinging nettle. You fill up a pot. I think they said halfway, but I don't know how much a pot was. You just, you know, have a something with a, a bunch of stinging nettle. You boil it down and then you put in, I think it was a quarter of a cup. You'd have to look at masterclass recipe. I can get it later um, of stinging nettle in with the goat cheese. It causes it to curd. And then um, I don't know if it was an hour or two, but you, you know, it gets kind of clotted and, um, and then you can make goat cheese out of it. So that third way I love, cause it's probably the way that like nomads, you know, and people in the Middle East and places in different parts of the world where they don't have lemons or they don't have um, vinegar at hand, they can just make goat cheese from the wild, right? From the wilderness. It's just so awesome. And then it? you can freeze it in ice cube trays, keep it in your free freezer and make, I make awesome goat's milk soap. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. If you have an excess amount, you can, um, yeah, make so. Okay. So Frankie's saying have your first goat, homemade goat cheese. Did it taste like, unlike any other goat cheese? It was so delicious. Yes. It was like a little bit sweet, but the salt, you know, balances out and it was so fresh and, and soft and creamy and it was amazing. And yeah. And there's been a lot of times when I've had milk and I feel mucusy afterwards, like congested, you know, and tired. And I don't feel that way with goat cheese. It just feels like a, like a decadent treat, you know, something that's creamy and, you know, makes you feel good. And, you know, it's just, you know, and you made it from your own goats. I know. And, it was, and it's raw. So it has all the good bacteria in there, you know? And so my kids, I feel like my, my one son Oh my gosh, he makes the dreamiest drink with it. He, he he takes matcha tea. We learned this from a farm in Vermont. Matcha tea, and I think it's a little like a drop of vanilla and honey, and makes a delicious goat's milk matcha drink uh, with it. And what the farmers in Vermont did was they add peach juice for the matcha tea and peach juice into the goat milk for the sweetness. And um, it is to die for. It's like the matcha and the goats. I mean, it's just, it's really, really good. So just wanted to share that little bit. Zen, Zen, sorry, this is Mark. If you can't keep up with your goats, please spray it on your garden. Oh. It will do amazing things with your garden. It's all bioavailable calcium and everything else that you just mentioned is in there and it will snap your plants back immediately. Do you need, do you need you to might, dilute you it? Might, yeah, well, to spray it on, you probably want to cut it with water, mm -hmm. you know, so that your sprayer will spray it. But uh, many organic farmers uh, also, if if anybody's ever dumping milk, they'll get that and they'll spray it on their crops. Excellent that, source. That's a great tip. Thank you very much. So if you've got a sick sort of plant, right, a plant that's not doing too well, a little bit of goat's milk, that's great. Um. Okay, very cool. Anybody else have anything else you want to share before we uh, time out here? See, we didn't need to have an expert because we have Mark. I know. Thank you, Mark. For, well, he is an expert. Thank you, Mark, for coming on and filling in here. And too. everybody else has all these great suggestions. So this is awesome. I love this. Yeah. Well, an X is a has been and a spurt is a drip under pressure. So I guess I qualify. <laughs> too much <laughs> oh, well we appreciate what you're doing thank you so much for working hard and having it be um you know uh, uh or regenerative organic farm in an oasis out there thank you very much for being on i appreciate it and uh, yeah lise and rachel and carl and um melina i didn't i don't know if we all these people thank you everybody for being on we will so next week is 4th of July, right? No, it's not. Yes, it is. Today is the 27th, not the 20th. I know. I said, Where did June go? I said it was the 20th, the beginning of this episode. We're going to have to edit that out. So it's the 27th. <laughs> and um, next week is 4th of July. So we won't be meeting. I will miss you all. But I hope that you will be in your gardens. And you will come next week, the week after that, June 11th, July 11th. Um, I, we had scheduled to have Mark back again. We'll talk to him and see if that's possible, but thank you for coming on this time, Mark. And, um, if anybody has any suggestions for experts that you want to have on, like, let's just say, you know, a really good person who grows great tomatoes or, you know, has been in this for a while, 
um, you know, we'd love to have guests that have something intentional, that, you know, specific and topic that they want to talk about. And send us pictures of your gardens. Oh, yes. And didn't get anybody sending pictures of their garden last week. Sylvan, we want to see your garden. Joan, I know you're growing something. Now, Nell, are you growing? I, I, I grow microgreens and tomato in small pots like that. With, uh, Perfect. Like, we it, want to see that. Grow, yeah. we want, yes, we want to see pots. <laughs> Did you know, okay, so this book, The Grow Network, The Grow System by uh, Marjorie Wildcraft, she says that New York City has 14,000 acres of root rooftops that could feed 20 million people on it. So if you're growing in pots, you're, you could be, right, like, like that, feeding people, feeding yourselves. Oh, that were my, I have to share a picture. Keep talking, I have to share a picture. Okay, yeah, so check her out. The Grow System by Marjorie um, Wildcraft. Our dream is to get her on with us to answer questions, but she has a great um, network of people and a lot of advice and good, um, you know, uh, webinars and things like that. So yeah. she, says, she says that basically what you need if you're gonna eat rabbits is three rabbits, two does in a buck, six chickens and, and 500 square feet of garden space per person if you want to feed two people for six months. That's all you need. So um, you just know you can do it. You can grow food and you can be sustainable. So, yes. okay, I'm gonna share. Um, can you see that? Yay, look at that. Oh, these, these, are, these are two boys who live behind me and I was in the garden and they came in and you know, they were trying to be kind of cool and they said, oh, we're just checking up on you and everything. So we started to talk and I ended up telling them to go get two black pots. As you see, I'm growing a lot of stuff in pots mm -hmm. over here. And I had them put like a few inches of wood chips in the bottom and then I had them shovel and compost. And then I brought out a set packet of seed, lettuce seeds and I showed them how to sprinkle it on and how to water it and told them they had to take these home and water them twice a day and that they had to come back and check in with me. And so, yeah, it was really cool. Yay! Uh, how old are they, would you say? How old are these boys? Uh, oh, 10, 11, 12, I don't know. I didn't ask, but they've been coming into my garden for a couple of years now, so. And um, you're creating the neighborhood food network in your neighborhood. There well, you they're, go. Not, they're not on my street, so technically, but they're on the street behind me. So well, they're in your neighborhood. So right. good, great job. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. If you want to know how to start the neighborhood food network in your neighborhood, go to our website, neighborhoodfoodnetwork.com and click on getting started and check out the invitation, the first meeting. The flyer that we have up there now and another we have a new flyer that's all about trying to you know gather people's email and texts to create an emergency network uh system basically connect everyone thank you everyone thank you Susie, michelle and chris and everybody frankie for being on we'll thank see you. you in two weeks have a great fourth of july take care everybody thanks you too bye, -bye. bye everybody bye, -bye.